pretty exciting today. You know, one of the opportunities we've had in DX over the years is these great conversations with developers, uh, you know, from all walks of life, all companies uh, in the industries, talking about how we work together. And, you know, one of the best things of the job is that opportunity to, to work with developers on frontline problems and new technology areas. So why don't we get started with machine learning? And uh, my understanding is you were up at Snowbird doing some skiing. Let's take a look. What's going on? How about that tram ride? Pretty I never, good, huh? That's a sweet tram. Where, yeah. where am I, man? I just woke up. <laughs> I got on a plane last night, landed somewhere. Where am I? Well, you're not going to get a better tram ride other than uh, here at Snowbird. And uh, thanks for joining us here at National Academy. We're excited here at PSIA ASI. I mean, we we are the educational arm of the snow sports industry, and we want to we want to. Anything that drives education forward that can help us deliver a better product out on the snow, we want to be a part of. We have our top pros, our top athletes. We have a national team made up of 13 Alpine skiers. And what we've been doing is we've been putting these uh, sensors on them, as well as we've been putting our sensors on our members, our ski instructors who are out here skiing with them. And what we're really trying to do is we're, we're going to find out, um, evaluate their movement patterns, what makes these national team members the best and then overlay that information and, and take a look at how can this give the general public a visual to become better at the sport they're doing. Yeah, this is pretty cool from the tech side. So, so normally when we think about sort of capturing sort of IoT or, you know, the puck here device data, um, people think about sort of low frequency. Hey, did somebody turn a switch on or right. off? And not very often. Yeah. The notion of sort of having an IoT device at high frequency is sort of an interesting problem because you got to capture people as they're coming down the mountain. And so right. the team's done a good job of, of building a sensor that operates at high frequency, low cost, that we can attach to the, the skier or right. the skis, and then connecting it through Bluetooth to the phone, which is pretty cool because right. that gives you the high frequency part. Then feeding that all up to the cloud in Azure so that we can collect all the data we have sort of a very high uh, amount of data that then we can go run machine learning models against right over time you think about applying proactive or predictive to this a little bit of AI yeah. and really sort of in the ear of somebody coming down saying hey that last turn you know you leaned in a little bit too far or you did something a little wrong you know and the next one changed a little bit based on your style and your skiing right, and, right. and what the pros do so really cool to sort of take the best of sort of IOT Bluetooth sort of connection up to the cloud um, so there are the Azure side the machine learning side big data side so for us, fun technology pulls right, right, all right. the pieces together. Yeah. For, for you and, and the rest, uh, sort of how do we think about the athletes and, and, and to your point, training and education, pretty slick partnership combination. We're excited. I mean, all the members and, and our teams that have been out there, when the Microsoft team has been like, hey, here's the phone, here's the app, and they're like, wait a minute, this is real time, they can see this immediately. It's kind of blowing people's minds, the possibilities that are out there. So we're looking forward to seeing what, bringing this thing to life and seeing what it can do for us. So why is this important to you guys? Being the arm of education for the snow sports industry, we really want to be at the forefront of any innovation. Our charge is to grow the snow sports industry, to get people to be safe and have a good time out there. And if this is something that can help them be better, we want to be a part of it. All right. Well, look, I'm all about getting better. Let's go out and test this out. I'm, I'm interested to see if I get better Looking forward to it. Let's do all it. All right, let's go. Yeah. You ready to get suited up and go skiing? All right, let's go skiing. All what do right. we got here? Well, we have the sensors. So okay. what I'm going to be doing is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put them on uh, your upper body here. Okay. They're going to be evaluating your upper body movements. And I we'll see. also put these on your knees. Yeah. And uh, from there, yeah. they will be able to track all your body movements. Every time we do a run, yeah. what you're going to do is you're going to push that red button there. Got it. Started sensor tracking experiment 13. Experiment 13. You ready to go skiing? That's me. Time to go learn something. Let's go skiing. Let's go skiing. Yeah. Yeah. Pure fall line, straight down to where all those people are. Straight down. Straight down. Okay. And you'll just follow me. OK. Ready to go? Yeah, hold on. Let's go. Let's do it. Yeah, nice. It's perfect. Yeah, so we'll take one more run and okay. get a couple more shots. And yeah, let's take a look at the data. Okay. You can see all the sensors on your body. Right. You can see where they're hooked up, two under your knee, two on your elbows, or below your right. elbows. And right. You can see how many test quick cases we've done. Right. So. And it's telling me, it told me the amount of vertical. I think it told me max speed. I wasn't oh, yeah, no, it, the app tells all that. Max speed, vertical, all of that. I thought it was cool, because when you when you passed, I heard it said you hit 900. Yeah, yeah, 900 feet. Feet. Yeah, that's pretty funny. All right, push that sensor again. Yeah, which way are we going? And we're going to do a little bit shorter radius turn. And you follow me this one, and then we're going to do one okay. more. Here, here we go. OK. Oh. Yeah, nice. Well, let's head on down to the base area and we'll, okay. we'll check out the data. 
That was a good day, huh? Uh, good day, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now we have all the data on sort of how I was skiing, so we can right. flip it back to the software guys and right. see what the data tells us. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to seeing that, and that's where it's gonna help us education-wise the best. Oh, well, look, I, I, you know, personally, I think I was as good as Nick, but I'm really curious to see what the data says. Well, let's take a look. What we wanted to do is spend some time looking at how we can use machine learning to understand if people are doing a good job skiing or not. Yes, John, we actually created uh, an open source uh, sensor kit to enable anybody, all app developers, to connect to uh, sensors to gather that data and then upload it to the cloud and use the machine learning models. Okay, so it's going from the skis to an Azure SQL database. We also partnered, uh, John, with the Professional Ski and Snowboard Instructors of America to, to actually analyze this data and make a really smart machine learning model that really enables skiers to understand the movement. Okay, so let's go into Azure Machine Learning Studio. We'll start with a blank experiment, and I need to import some data. I'm gonna just drag that over here, and you said it was in an Azure SQL database. SQL database. And put that database server name yep. in. And for the database name, you can use our sensor study. And then we're going to select uh, oh, yeah, some gotta, of the data. We got to get that query in. It's actually yeah. very, very helpful that the Machine Learning Studio provides a way to, uh, to provide that initial query. This is how we get the data out of that database. Mm -hmm. but yeah, there we go, save. save. At this point in time, we got the data. We now, uh, I know you and Patty spent a little bit of time on this doing some processing with some of the key kind of R libraries, these packages. Exactly, yeah. So what we need to do is we need to import one of those packages, and then we're going to run a script that Patty came up with to do the data. Now, this is a set of R scripts. Mm -hmm. So execute uh, R. Execute R script. R script, yep. And all we need to do now is we need to pump that into here, right? Yep. And import the data in, and now we've got an R script. This is the default. That's what the machine learning studio gives you. Yeah, by so yep. we're going to just kind of nuke that. We'll and, use Patty's. and let's use Patty's. This is the other thing she said we have to do. Um, so I'm just going to go grab this. Tell me about what's going on here. Yeah, we're taking data directly from the sensors and mapping them to composite features ah. within our data model. So for example, I'm really looking at the ski instructor, I'm really looking at the uh, upper body rotation, for example, or I'm looking at the feet position. So this is the difference between the hands. Yeah. You're grabbing the 48th row in the 100 column. Yeah, <laughs> so that's all this raw data. Excuse you're doing the difference, and that gives you the difference in X, Y, and Z, and then you're storing it into that data set. So the amazing things, uh, thing about this data is that, John, we were able to identify two 1,070 features specific to scheme uh, just by analyzing the data. And, and those features is exactly what you're mapping to. Yeah. Now what we'd like to do is we'd like to train a model on this. And we'd like to see if that model could be used to predict whether or not Googs is going to be a good skier. Exactly. That's, that's exactly what we're trying to look at. We got this data coming in. We're going to want to train it, but we're going to want to train it on only a part of the data, and yep. then we're going to want to look at the other piece in order to check our predictions. And that's pretty straightforward to do. We're just going to split it 70-30, and let's execute the results of that R script down to the split data. And now let's go to that model, train the model. Yeah. So train and machine learning model that we're going to train, and we're going to train that model with that 70% of the data. This is a pretty simple data set. And so we'll do the, the really simple one because yep. we kind of know binary. We'll do the two-class logistic regression model. Mm -hmm. We'll pull that over here, and that's an input. That algorithm then becomes an input into the training model. In order to do an evaluation, we're going to need kind of two scores. We're going to need the score that we got from the training data, mm -hmm. and we're going to need the score that we get from the data that wasn't used in the training set because that'll exactly. give us an idea of whether or not we actually know what we're doing here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out those two score systems. So we'll have one here, yeah. and we'll have one here. And we'll connect this one to the this one to the this data right there. Yep. And we'll have as input the model, right? Uh -huh. And then we got to do one more, which is now we need to use this yeah. one. Uh -huh. This one over here. Yeah. And then let's take that non-trained data. All right, now we need to do the last little step here, which is evaluate that model, right? Yep. And that takes the two inputs. 
and uh, I think we're actually ready to go do some machine learning and try it out. Anything else we think we ought to do? Yeah, just, just one last thing. So remember, John, when we when we created the features, yep. one of the features we, that we created was actually called the skill level. Yes. So what we want to do is we want to go into oh, yeah, our yeah, train model. Right, so exactly, and, and select that um, skill level. If you type in skill level, this is one of the composite features that we identified to tell. To distinguish good, between exactly. Googs and yes. the pro. Exactly. Let's take a look at the results. Oh, that's an incredible score. So we actually have an incredible accuracy here, John. Close to 99% accuracy. I think what it's saying is it's pretty easy to tell the difference between Googs yeah. and a professional skier. That, is that what we're much. really saying here? OK. Now, what I wanted to do is I want to spend a minute or two talking with our data expert, Patty. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, John. Hey, Patty. So you're looking at the model. Yeah, this is pretty incredible. Oh, the results are great. There's great variation between these body positions and uh, patterns of an intermediate versus a pro. So what you can see here with Googs is that it's markedly higher. So he kept his, his body upright versus the pro who was crouching, leaned into the hill, and a real significant difference between those two here. I also use um, Jupyter Notebooks. And this is a cool tool because it, it really keeps keeps your analysis and your story and your narrative clean and allows you to kind of collaborate around your findings um, with others and, and really push it to the next level. One of the things that I like to look at um, when I'm kind of understanding a model, here we're understanding the variance. This tells us what the most important variables are between the pro and the intermediate. That's right. So wow, that gives that's you, fascinating. This shows you at a high level the variation in the model and how many components of variation it takes to explain the, the, your model. Uh -huh. And what this tells you with this nice sweet curve is that, yes, with, with a small subset of variables, you can really tell a very clear story. And then this next piece is uh, mapping the components of variance with each of the variables. So each of the variables here is um, labeled on one of these uh, uh, arrow vectors in blue. Okay. Um, and so we can understand the, the story of that variance. So, so what you see here here is this really nice differentiation. So what you see over here on the right side is the pro and, and then the kind of that. that wow. uh, uh, it's the side really side. that stark. But this is beautiful. You can read these and develop kind of an intuitive notion of what the variations are. It seems like machine learning and artificial intelligence is going to be very rich and as a tool to help people improve their performance and do other things. Oh, yeah. It's really exciting. I think this is just, just the beginning. Really appreciate you guys coming. As, as John and I always talk about, we love the conversations we get to have with the folks we get to work with. Um, why don't we start off with just a little introduction with from everybody. I'm Kevin Grant, Chief Technology Officer for Farmer's Edge. Farmer's Edge works in what we call the decision agriculture space. We manage grower data, trying to optimize decisions on the farm to maximize profit, um, minimize cost. Hi, I'm Sal Sayed. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Arcos Golf. And what Arcos is, is a hardware and software platform for golfers. It tracks all their data, and then using all that data helps them make better decisions in terms of club selection or understanding their strengths and weaknesses. Tell us a little bit about how you got started working with Microsoft. What was the kind of business problem you were thinking about mm -hmm. where AI might apply? When you look at the history of golf, 100 years ago, every single round was played with a caddy. Today, less than 3% of rounds are played with caddies. And the idea of what the caddy was doing was helping you make optimal decisions in terms of your club selection. Every time you step up to the ball, what club should you hit? Today, golfers are kind of doing that on their own. And we thought the perfect ap application of all the data that we're collecting is using machine learning to make that decision that much smarter, that much more intelligent. Actually, not unlike the story we just heard, um, when you're in farming, you rely a lot on your data and a lot on expertise. So uh, your farmer has trusted advisors, um, like their fertilizer reps and their seed reps and um, people of that nature. In the past, you've had kind of these mom and pop agri agronomy shops that could service 20,000 acres or 30,000 acres. And what we want to do is we want to take that model and be able to service you know, a quarter million acres per rep. We really feel, and this is going to sound a little cliche, but we feel like this is a market that's really ripe for disruption. Um, so there's a lot there's of- a pun in there, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's ripe and fun. 
alarming, but we'll just keep going. Cliche and pun all in one. We're, you're on a roll. Go. We're collecting, you know, real-time equipment data, um, whereas before you might have collected a yield map at the end of the season and maybe an as-applied map at the start of the season. Take all of that data, push it through a machine learning algorithm, and see what comes of it. And what kind of impact are we talking about? Is it cost? Is it increase yields. We want to get as much yield as possible um, for a given amount of fertilizer. And in order to do that, we need to know where to put that fertilizer. Are you thinking ahead to doing some deep learning on this, or where, where do you see this going? We're sitting on hundreds of terabytes of data, um, you know, quickly moving into petabytes. I, I think we're going to need to look to uh, the complexity of deep, deep learning, TensorFlow, those, those sorts of things to uh, really take us to the next step of innovation. One of the things we love doing are these hack fests, where we get your engineers in a room with our engineers. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how that went. What was eye-opening to me was how quickly, if you have the data, that you can get all these insights. You can actually predict outcomes at a very interestingly high rate. So for example, right now, with 70% certainty, I can tell you before you've taken a swing whether you're gonna get a par on that hole or not. Wow. And <laughs> That's not good in my case, because <laughs> I don't get enough pars, so this is, gonna, this is just all going wrong. <laughs> It helped us realize the power of machine learning because we hadn't gotten our hands dirty till then. Then it became our mission, like, okay, wow, this is so powerful. We have all this data. We're going to build the world's smartest caddy. Now, I'm sure it didn't all go perfectly well. What were some of the challenges you had to overcome? I'd say one of the things that if there was an option to undo a model, it would save us a lot of time. Um, and then maybe version control. Yes. How do you guys think about sort of either low bit rate or, or sort of, you know, connectivity in general for the farmers and helping them figure that out? Because that's one of the hard problems when you think about large spaces and, um, you know, low power sensors. So that actually turns out to be one of our biggest challenges, especially in the other world areas where you have very uh, limited cellular coverage and, and things like that. We might be out there collecting data for hours and hours and hours, and we have to store that data locally. But yes. then when we get back, you know, we won't, don't want to run the battery down on the tractor while we're trying to get it pushed up. And so, you know, yeah. there's some things that, that are pretty tough to solve out there. That notion of sort of compute on the edge and compute in the cloud is one that we're, we're pretty focused on right now as a pattern that we see growing over time. And you're, yeah. you're literally on the edge of that conversation. That, that is exactly um, so are right. you in many ways, you know, yeah. with the, the French. And one of the great things about the role is talking to you, talking to many other companies, we, we hear feedback on how we should improve. And it's great to be able to collect that together mm -hmm. and then bring it back to the engineering teams. And in a lot of cases, maybe even build some of the pieces so that we can we can help the companies you know make more rapid progress the uh sort of machine learning and ai it, it's it it will have an impact on sort of all horizontal sort of you know business processes or or sports processes it'll hit every industry out there it's it's couldn't be a more exciting time in this space i'd love to get your thoughts on what you see just you know if you go out a year two years three years the things that you get excited about in this space one thing we're seeing is a renegotiation between of the interaction between the human and the computer so if we look even 20 years ago or 25 years ago all of the insight and all of the decision came from the person and the computer was just kind of a dumb servant to uh, to help them along and what we're seeing now is almost a reversal a machine might not be able to say why, why? something's yeah. happening but they can say that something's happening and at that point we we need to send the agronomist out to, uh, um, to help. I'd like to build on that. First thing we're doing is making golfers smarter by helping them make smarter decisions. But the reality is this data that we're capturing, um, we're tracking everywhere the golfer is going, when they're playing, what clubs they're using, how are they playing. This is going to make the entire industry more efficient. And I, I would say that exact theme is going to play out in literally every single industry where um, the decisions are going to be that much smarter. And as a result, the economies are going to be that much more efficient. That notion of AI complementing, you know, human capability and, and business outcomes, it's just a ton of fun and it's an area where I couldn't be more excited. And we appreciate you guys making the time to join us today. Both of these spaces, we both love to eat. John's a, a key foodie here and I'm, I actually like to play a lot of golf. So this is win-win <laughs> and uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's keep going together. We appreciate yeah. it. Keep up the good work. Thank Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.
So we're trying to do fusion. This is what happens in the sun. It takes temperatures like 100 million degrees. And, and people have been doing this for a long time. There's been a lot of R&D in national labs and other areas, and you get programs that use big magnetic fields, large superconducting magnets to hold, like create a magnetic bottle, or other programs that use massive lasers and they crush things to extremely high density. And so what General Fusion's trying to do is we're gonna form a magnetized plasma, so it's super hot gas wrapped in magnetic field, and compress it quickly. Yo, what's this? So we measure things like magnetic field and temperature, but you can't take your you know, mercury thermometer and stick it in there and say, oh yeah, okay, it's a million degrees. You've got to find other ways of doing that. We need to figure out ways not only to process it for our own use, but as we grow, we want to engage more and more of the scientific community. And so systems to be able to do that is, is key to us. Brendan here has been working with Microsoft on you know, how do we handle all of that data. So yeah, here we've got our uh, oscilloscopes capturing the data and digitizing the data that we then are going to uh, have to process and, and give this data to physicists internally. Uh, how, you, how you process that data, how you store that data, also how we distribute that data and share it with, with physicists outside of our organization. These are all of the, the problems that we're solving with Microsoft. Hey, why don't you take John over to Pi2, show him what he's up to. Sounds great. So this is a power plant scale plasma injector. So this is a scaled up version of the one that you saw before. Wow, so this thing is Big. Yeah. Now, what kind of data are you gathering in in a plasma injector? Well, each valve will produce a, a trace that shows us exactly the timing of each valve, so we can synchronize those within microseconds. Here, you can see all of these fiber optics. Each one of those is a signal, and this is just on the on this end of it, and we'll have much more instrumentation down on that end. Wow. So, as we push the plasma down the plasma injector and inject it into this target chamber, probes collecting magnetic field, temperature, or density. Okay. Each shot can produce 100 megabytes to a gigabyte of data, uh, and we take a shot every five or 10 minutes on as many as four injector stations. Uh, so we can produce over 100 gigabytes of experimental data in a day. Okay, very nice. Let's keep moving, John. Okay. So this is our prototype compression system. This is the other half of a power plant. And so we pump liquid lead lithium into the sphere. We pump it in tangentially and get it spinning. The plasma is injected inside that cavity, that, that cylindrical cavity, and then these pistons behind me will all hammer the surface of the sphere, and that will send an acoustic pressure wave through the liquid lead, uh, compressing the plasma. And that's what ignites the fusion. Yeah. Now, normally somebody using this kind of, this amount of data would use something like Hadoop. What we realized very quickly is that in that case, you're married to a, a Java-based environment. Mm -hmm. And we work with a whole variety of different codes. Uh, some of these codes have decades of collaboration between scientists. Uh, so we want to be able to use the right tool for the right job, as opposed to being married to a, a specific product or a specific tool chain. Makes sense. So one of the things that we've done together, which I think is super fun, is Instead of using Hadoop, we use this new tool chain around Pachyderm. Absolutely, yeah. So Pachyderm is a is a new tool chain that a new tool that provides everything that Hadoop does, uh, but it lets us define the actual processing code using containers. And Pachyderm then schedules those container jobs using Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a container orchestrator that will then uh, distribute those jobs and load balance and scale as necessary. Wow, we're looking here at what might be the future of energy on the planet, and we're building out a new tool chain so that researchers and, and people developing it can, can look at it. What's really exciting, too, is that the, the use of these uh, open source scalable tools, it lets us focus our resources not on software development, but on uh, fusion and science. That's great. Now, the liquid lead comes out of here? Yeah, so we actually uh, we melt the lead here. We're back again. We're gonna move from machine learning uh, and talk a little bit about modern app patterns. We have our friends from General Fusion up north, second Canadian company today, pretty awesome. Core OS from San Francisco, representing a little bit of the south. Can you guys just introduce yourselves, talk a little bit about, let's start with General Fusion, a little bit about your background and uh, what you guys are working on and then we'll pop over. My name is Jonathan Fraser. We're uh, from a company called General Fusion and we're working on uh, changing up the way we're doing the data analysis for our prototype uh, power plant. Hi, and I'm Brendan Cassidy, also with General Fusion. Uh, John and I are both working on a, a data science initiative to manage our experimental physics data using modern cloud-based techniques. And I'm Rob Sumsky. I'm a product manager and designer at CoreOS. And we're bringing uh, containers to the enterprise, um, cloud-native applications, uh, helping folks like yourselves build their data pipelines and uh, run their web applications. 
this one's exciting. Like a fusion conversation in software. Tell me a little bit about how software plays into this whole conversation. So we're working on a way to take our data analysis platform out of a more traditional stream that you would encounter uh, working in, in these sorts of laboratory environments. And we're trying to take that and, and marry that with some of the innovations that have been done in the, in the modern web applications so that we can, we can scale this analysis over all the data that we're collecting on our, on our fusion chains. Tell me a little bit about the connection between Microsoft and Journal Fusion. Like, how did, how did we connect on this uh, conversation? We were put in touch with, uh, with the DX uh, group at Microsoft. They wanted to send some people up, and we sat down and, and hacked together and got, uh, I believe it was the first deployment of Pachyderm on Kubernetes on Azure uh, up and running with uh, a couple late days and uh, a lot of hard work and a lot of fun. I think the thing that was really interesting about the design that we came up with was this notion of using containers as a way to package up the parts of the tool chain and then be able to use Pachyderm on top of Kubernetes to go distribute that. That's a, that's a little different workflow than you typically see with large amounts of data. The middle ground there was to, to pick a container that we can put these tools into and just inject the data into it so that the system is agnostic whether it's running Fortran or some older physics package. Or writing new stuff in new languages. It's the right tool for the right job. One of the things that we've been really enjoying is this work that we're doing with companies like CoreOS where we're taking this new approach to applications with containers and the orchestration of those things, getting it up and running on Azure to solve these kind of problems. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that we've been doing together and, and how that's gone? Yeah, uh, so uh, we have a mutual customer um, that was running on uh, another uh, platform and wanted to also use our uh, product Tectonic on top of Azure. Um, and so we engaged a bunch of uh, the Azure engineers. We invited them down to our office in San Francisco uh, and then also did a hack session up here. Um, and we uh, really quickly were able to get Tectonic up and running on Azure, um, taking advantage of some of the newer features uh, that you guys have unlocked with storage. And now, how do you think about taking existing uh, technologies like the Fortran um, and then putting it together in these environments? Um, some things are, you can kind of uh, lift and shift it into a container and that works well. Other things, um, you actually can lean on using virtualization again uh, to run VMs inside of a container. Um, we've used this at one of our customers to uh, containerize a very, very old uh, system uh, that is still in That's production cool. today. Um, so ease that operational burden of maintaining this super old piece of hardware, um, bring it in virtually into a containerized environment. It's interesting because that's one of those areas we, we deal a lot with enterprise customers where, you know, the movement to the cloud isn't this, you know, magical off we go. You know, having, having containers and other tool sets to work with apply sort of these modern techniques to, it, it's sort of a step forward, I think, for everyone. You talked about this notion of storage and the Azure Key Vault uh, being integrated. We've got a clip of some of that code in operation. Let's take a look at that. Hi, Rita. Hey, John. I'm going to show you what it's like for an enterprise developer to push an existing application to the cloud, leveraging solutions like containers and container orchestrator solutions like Kubernetes on Azure. Great. Uh, we're just running a simple application that has three tiers, the database, the API, and then the web tier. This is running on a single VM on Azure. I have a script that deploys everything. It is pulling the Mongo database image from Azure Container Registry. And, it and is, that's your private enterprise repository. Exactly. And it is also mounting the local file system to the container so that we can persist the data. OK. So next, we have the API layer. And this is a Java Spring application that allows us to serve the, the data. And then we have opened up the port on 8080 so that other parts of the application can talk to it. And it is also talking to the database with this connection string. And next we have the web component, which is just running the Tomcat piece, and it is also talking to the API layer, and this is the endpoint for the API layer. Great. This is basically the container that's running on this dev machine. So this is all working great for development, but now I want to push to staging and production, and this is where uh, a, a container orchestrator solution like Kubernetes can really help. In my organization, the IT group already provisioned a Kubernetes cluster for me on Azure, so I'm able to just worry about pushing my applications. And here, what I have 
doing right now is listing all the VMs in the cluster. And here we have a Kubernetes master and five agent nodes that is waiting to serve applications like this one. In this case, we're running on Azure. What's going to be involved in taking one of the components and actually getting it up to that Kubernetes cluster? What we want to do is do the same thing, but describe it so that Kubernetes can deploy all these containers for us and understand what resources we need, what, what images to pull, right? Okay. I've gone to GitHub and going to the uh, Kubernetes repo, and here I've just gone ahead and grabbed a sample YAML file that describes what I need for all each one of these components. Yep. Correct. I've updated that YAML file so that I can tell Kubernetes, here's the database piece of my application. Yep. And I'm able to describe to Kubernetes, deploy it to this namespace, Contosol, and pull the Mongo database image from my private Azure container registry. And I've also described to open up the port here so that other components of my application can actually talk to the database. And you made a similar set of edits to create YAML files for each of the web components that describe how they work. Yes. So let's let's deploy this one as well as those other two. We're going to deploy the database one. Now we're going to do the API one and the web one. OK. And so once this is done, we should have our app up and running. Yeah, definitely. It's already provisioned these containers for me, and it's running in the cluster. but. In order for me to actually reach these containers, what Kubernetes allows me to do is create services like this, and that leverages Azure Load Balancer that allows us to... Tr Point to the... Exactly, to tr route the traffic to the right containers. Okay. It'll give us a public IP address. Exactly. This is my web component, and it is hosted on this external IP. Now, I noticed you had used Mongo inside of a container, mm -hmm. and that's a great kind of thing to do during development, but... In reality, if we were running this thing as a real application, that data wouldn't be persistent. Yep. What do you do? Yeah, that's a, I'm glad you caught that. This is where we had our YAML file, and there was no persistent storage. What we want, however, is an external storage that yep. allows us to persist the data even if the entire cluster is gone, right? Yep. Um, so there are many ways to do this in Kubernetes, but coming soon in version 1.7, we are now adding Azure Managed Disk support. And what's that give us? Well, with Azure Managed Disk, um, you can have highly scalable and highly available SSD premium storage. Wow. Okay. This is the new database um, YAML description file. So here is a volume mounted Got here. It. So the Mongo database is actually going to read and write to this file path. And to the container, it's actually going to create the managed SSD storage uh, from the storage class. Can you go back to your original script? And I, I notice in this, you've got a path. Mm -hmm. to the MongoDB, and I see you've got a complex password in there. Yeah. That's pretty common during development. Mm -hmm. You put, you just kind of hard code the passwords in there. That's not going to work out in a real-world deployment. So what we can do is we can actually, uh, again, similar to the database one, but we can update it so that we can leverage Azure Key Vault. Now, with Azure Key Vault, we have a secure and compliant way to store and retrieve all of our certificates, our secrets, our keys, and, and so on. Yeah. Instead of referencing the connection string from the Mongo database, what we're doing instead is we're telling it to attach a volume and getting the key uh, from Azure Key Vault. Vault. Oh, that's pretty awesome. So if we bounce back to the, to the test app, we should be able to see everything running. Now, it shouldn't look any different, but this is now a very different app than that initial app we started with. Correct. That's pretty amazing that you were able to do that so quickly. Yes, definitely. So thanks, Rita. Really appreciate your coming here and giving us all of the insights and showing us how to go do this. Can you tell us a little bit about how the, the actual hacking on this went? The customer um, had uh, a set of applications that they were uh, bringing over to the cloud, and uh, so we ended up walking through a bunch of architectures of how should we get traffic into these clusters, um, either using native Kubernetes ingestion or um, kind of wiring things in directly with um, port mappings and that type of thing. Talked through uh, different scalability concerns of each of each architecture and uh, kind of went from there, and um, the customer is off and running uh, right now. I want to go to this hack fest because I want to know if they let them play with the rail gun, if they let them help pull the vacuum on the, you know, I, they, there's there's hack fest for software, and then there's a hack fest on a, on the, your entire system. When you think about the actual, you know, coding over those couple of days, you know, 
what problem did you guys you know narrow in on and and spend time on and sort of where were things helpful and where did we run into some blocks uh, so we were working on on one of the first one of, or one of the earlier Kubernetes deploys on Azure to get some of this new framework uh, deployed. Some of the stuff was, of course, a little bit green. You know, the, it's, it was one of the first deploys. There's some sticking points there. Um, but, you know, luckily we have these, these uh, Partner Catalyst guys to help us out and get this stuff deployed smoothly. One of the things that was really cool is when we were hitting some sticking points, getting Kubernetes going, um, one, of the, one of the guys, one of the Microsoft guys said, you know what, I'm just going to contact the guy who built uh, Kubernetes, and within 25 minutes, we talked to him uh, directly and uh, had that answer solved. And we're like, "All right, well, that was that was easy." <laughs> We've made some progress. We've got some things going. How do you? And I'm going to ask both sides. How do you think about the future? Like, what's interesting in the next year, in the next two years? I mean, what know. happens with containers? What happens with modern apps? Uh, well, specifically with the data science project at General Fusion, uh, when, once we're uh, managing this data and able to kind of share and expose our uh, considerable amount of experimental physics data. One of the things, you know, in addition to sharing it with uh, external scientists, we're also interested in uh, once 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 we're able to manage this data and do more things with it, to then uh, apply modern data science tools like machine learning. So that's the second Microsoft hack fest we're looking forward to doing. And we're looking forward to accelerating folks like yourselves to you know focus on your day to day jobs and not be running all this infrastructure um, that as you you know you have a huge amount of data, it's getting more and more complicated. Um, we think that we can streamline those operations for you with self-driving infrastructure, um, automatic operating system updates, as well as cluster updates, um, such that you know, you're, you're building your containers, you're worrying about your code, you're generating uh, money for your company, or you're you know, furthering humanity <laughs> in your case. Um, but we want to help you do that on the infrastructure side. I like the furthering humanity. That's a good line. Yeah. What is amazing is just how often containers is the right solution for the right job. Like we've got our build environment, our deploy environment, everything's a container because you no longer have to worry about it built on my machine, it didn't build on this machine, you, which, which version of this Gives you have that installed. Isolation. You know exactly what you've got and what you're getting. This is a really good point that we find uh, <clears throat> containers, uh, when they have to be stored in a centralized location, provide a really nice touch point for security. Um, you can start scanning these images, um, seeing what's exactly what's in them, and if you need to do auditing on your side for is version A in this container or not, you can find that out, but also is CVE XYZ also in that container um, and you know, easily solve that problem. Uh, this is you know, targeted at uh, smaller companies as well as huge enterprises that you know, need to have auditability of these things. You could probably do that in a container too. Oh yes, it runs in a container on the cluster as well. <laughs> well look, we, we appreciate the, you making the time today and the, and the partnership and, and just the, again, the ongoing dialogue and the conversation, so. Keep it up, and uh, we'll look forward to continuing to work with you. We appreciate all the help and uh, working together on doing big things. Yeah. Yeah, let's onboard some more customers onto Azure. Awesome. 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 Love it. Thanks, man. Thanks. Now we want to get into the UI aspect, and one of the great conversations going on right now is new UI paradigms, really, or interaction models. And in this case, sort of virtual reality, mixed reality, augmented reality, um, that's the conversation we want to have. And so first off, let's do some introductions and a little background. So I'm Sylvain Duro, I'm the founder of Visua, uh, with my partner, Ed. I'm uh, Ed Ventura, I'm the uh, president and co-founder of Visua. My name is Jeff Sorensen. I'm the president and CEO of Terra Recon, where we're working with Visua uh, with very detailed uh, image renderings that we can put within the HoloLens. And there's much, much more to come in terms of what we can do with measurements and with pre-surgical planning and even the application of artificial intelligence in medicine. And a matter of fact, we had an opportunity to take a look at, uh, at Visua. Why don't we take a look? What we're going to show you today is Visua's uh, technology. And what we do is we do high-speed computing on Azure GPU. We're going to stream data to your HoloLens, and you're going to be able to manipulate in real time without any computing power on the HoloLens itself. Awesome. Looking yes. forward to that. Let's take a look. The heart that uh, Sylvain is bringing up now is, is very important as a practical use today surgical planning is an option. 
Uh, also, patient, doc, doctor-patient communication is important. Uh, patients don't understand what they're actually seeing from a general scan. So in this particular case, we've taken a CT scan, put it all together, slices of bread forming a loaf of bread, and in what we what we can do is is show the individual, the patient, the colleague, anywhere around the world, and talk about the same object in real time. No, it's cool. We can we can collaborate. You know, if, if either one of us was a, a doctor, you know, you can see this whole thing here, which is really cool. Yeah, if Sylvan just kind of steps in, yeah. he can actually move into the heart itself. What's important is not just seeing the surface of the heart. And right. I think that looks great. Uh, it's really more important to see the detail of the heart on the inside. We don't lose any information that comes from the scan itself. Yeah. That's really the important. Basically, what you see is what you get. Anything off the scans is going to be captured in, in this particular uh, stream. Yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible because the whole notion of sort of the holographic 3D image to start with is impressive. But then the ability for both of us to see it at the same time and collaborate, that's a, it's super unique. And you, you know, can't think of a better uh, case study than medicine. Well, and Collins as a client and Azure GPU are really going to be key for us. Thanks so much. Appreciate you making the time. Thank you thanks very much. Yeah, here. thanks a lot. I love that. Thanks for uh, spending the time with us on that. And, and speaking of cool technologies and, and demos, let's uh, continue around the table. Yeah, I mean, uh, my name is Amish Savarwal. I'm the Executive Vice President for the Americas for Aviva. Aviva is an engineering information management software company that back in the 70s had first brought 3D visualization to the complex processing industries like oil and gas, power, and petrochemicals. Uh, since then, we've been uh, bringing this technology to the masses, and this year we're bringing in mixed reality with HoloLens, and take a look at our uh, demo uh, right now. So last year on stage at Build, we showed on a Surface Hub an Aviva mock-up of an oil platform. We did, yes. Super cool. Sounds like there's some progress, some new new things. I got a hollow lens in my hand, so what do you got yeah, to show me? Yeah, so today we're going to look at a technology demonstrator. We've taken that oil platform, uh, a smaller version of that, and put it into the hollow lens to show our customers what an immersive experience would look like. So let's put on our lens All and right. take, take a walk through the demo. And I see an Aviva board, basically like a drawing board here. With so, a... yes, you can see it's a full-size A1 drawing, and you can get up very close to it and see, see the intricate details. I can, I can. I can see everything. Very cool. Good way to see uh, full skies drawing 2D information in the HoloLens experience. So yeah. the drawings are an older antiquated technique for collaboration between engineers and designers. So with the introduction of 3D, uh, we'll click on our 3D button. I just did. It's sort of flowing down. So and we, there it goes. It's coming out of the picture. Great. The head is slick. So now we have CAD data. So the next step in our demo is to um, take this model and, and put it on the floor and, and, and enlarge Yeah, I it. see enlarge 3D, so I'm gonna go over here, mm -hmm. enlarge 3D, and it says to look over here, and, and it's now, oh, there it is, look at that. So now that we should see the yeah, model in front yeah, of you. Yeah, I see it. Coming it's... up from the floor, and it plays a, a, a little construction sequence. Yeah, it, it actually with... grows, and, and it colors in, so I can see the tall piece here, and oh yeah, this is slick. So we have audio in the yeah. demo as well, so you can hear um, just, just some ambient construction sounds. <laughs> It says follow your gate. This is, yeah. So this is a 1-8 scale model. Yeah. It's about 10 feet tall, oh, but slick. still lets you fully immerse yourself in the 3D model, walk through it, yep. and, and get up close and personal with, with the intricate details. And it says this guy's little menu here. Yeah, so we have this digital concept of digital asset. So for example, uh, show feed pumps. All right, so show feed pumps. There it goes. And so all the colors have gone off everything but the feed pumps now. So this will show the yep. uh, cert highlight certain parts of the model. Yeah, the pump's over here. There we go. Okay, yep. There they are, right there. And you can see all the, the piping they're connected to, and they, they come around the other side. Slick. All right. So next step in the model is uh, over by the uh, easel, you see a... I see a human. Yes. Uh, our factory worker. Locate our friendly plant worker next to the drawing board. Air tap him, okay? So we're going to air tap and place him in the model. Okay. So this, in our industry, we do ergonomic checks when we design 3D plant systems. So we put a scale man in the model. To there see, he is. <laughs> yeah. See if he can reach valves. Or, right, right, right. So next or we're going we're to take this. the model full scale. Okay. So we're at one-eighth scale now, so. So let me back up out here so I give it some room. I see on the right here it says full scale. Yes. So let me go. There we go. So, so now I'm on the floor of the plant. There's my worker. My worker's over there. 
Uh, we're about the same height. Yeah, that is cool. So the, this thing is now all over the room. There's the feed pumps. I can see those over there now. Um, so the model's bigger than the room. So navigating yeah. through the model, we've had to introduce a teleporting capability so you can kind of jump and teleport. The yeah, it says uh, teleport. So say enable teleport. So I'm going to enable teleport. And then use your gaze to. Okay, to I see it. Yep. I want to go. On the spot. I want to go up on the top of these ladder up here. Oh, slick. So now I'm on top here, and now I can look down. Oh yeah, well, how it's. So let's this experience. Aha, that goes all the way through the roof. I want to go all the way up there. <laughs> now I'm basically on top of the world. Holy crud! You, I can see the I can see the man down there. Yes. That is really cool. So the last piece is uh, yep. we've got uh, 3D sounds. We have spatial sounds in our experience. Okay. So we, we've, uh, this is kind of a live digital yep. asset. So um, it says follow the sound to the faulty pump. Yeah, so let's teleport down, back down to the ground floor. Okay, I'm gonna go right next to the man. There we are, brothers and, in arms. And the challenge is to find the pump that's, that's sounding like it's about to fail. So there's a 3D spatial sound yep. put into the system. Yep. So as you walk through the 3D environment, the sound fall off increases or, or decreases. Yep. And there's a pump that's starting to fail. Yep. Once you find that, do you click on it? It should be on the very corner or the very edge of the 3D model. Yeah. All right, we'll shut the pump down. So as a worker now, I've figured that out. Yeah, so we can get 2D information into to this uh, HoloLens mixed reality world, show uh, maintenance procedures, troubleshooting procedures right there in, in the environment itself. Slick. I mean, compare, you know, last year I thought it was pretty cool to, to you know, blow it up on the surface up. It's a whole other world to be able to step into the model. It is. Teleport around, put a human in it, put yourself in it. It's, I'll tell you what, I, I can't imagine there's anybody you work with who doesn't try this out and go, holy crud. Yeah, all the customers that we show this to are, are super excited about it and, and are coming up, coming up with ways to use it uh, with, with their own uh, awesome. companies. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. I'm going to pull this off now and get out of the plant. That was incredible. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, Appreciate thank you it. so much. Thanks for making the time and thanks for the incredible progress. You're Love welcome. It. Appreciate Love it. it. You can just sort of see the, the movement forward in terms of the technology and the capability and bring it to life uh, in true uh, mixed reality fashion. These are pretty sophisticated, complex models that we're looking at, whether it be in oil and gas, medical, mm -hmm. streaming them from the cloud. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the things that's been great about the Babylon project is just making 3D so accessible. In fact, we did a little bit of work on that. Why don't we take a look at that? What is Babylon JS? What do people use it for? So Babylon JS is a free and open source uh, 3D engine running on every WebGL platforms, and it's to build games or 3D experiments in the browser. Nice. You're on version three. What's in version three? A lot of stuff, but mainly a new playground. We're currently improving a lot of performance, and we're working on VR. So let's take a look at a couple of those things. So I've been playing with a playground. The whole thing's written in TypeScript. Yes. So you get statement completion, and you can see all the information about the calls. I mean, check this out, right? Sphere dot position. I get all of that stuff, and I could say, say, plus equals one. And if I just hit run, like I can move this stuff around. It's so cool to just be able to use this free form JavaScript editor with all the statement completion because of that TypeScript work. Yeah, so. the idea is to let people playing with the API rather than directly learning by mm -hmm. reading the doc, which is really cool. Yeah, now if I do window.add event listener, and we just do a quick event listener for, say, the, the key down event. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a quick Lambda function in here, which we can do now, right? This is a yes. cool thing about the browsers. Let's just now do that same move. We'll do the sphere.position.x plus equals. It should be perfect. Like that will have me actually doing a kind of interactive system here. So the next big thing that you said was this VR stuff. And yes, and also the beauty of, well, JavaScript and what working is working cross-platform and browser. there. So maybe let's check the other part in, in a special bill of Chromium. So here's a scene. This is just like kind of what we built before, maybe a little bit cooler. Yeah. What would it take to add VR to this? Well, you see, currently we're using a specific camera, which is a universal one to be able yep. to move using the keyboard, gamepad, whatever. We just need to switch this line, and maybe we should have a look to the documentation to check if we are okay, so here's, good enough here's documentation. Here's the Babylon documentation. You have these overviews, mm -hmm. and what we want 
using the VR camera? Exactly, let's check. Okay. Out. The simplicity of Babylon is to switch the behavior with just one line of code. So let's copy paste this line of code. And really, this is all I'm going to need to change to get VR going here? All right, let's check that together. <laughs> okay, so here, I'll just comment this line out so we can kind of compare. And look at that. So instead of the universal camera, we're you doing the web VR directly. camera. Yeah. You could have used IntelliSense and just done switched. it. Okay. So if I run this, what do we get? You see, we've got a double run ring because it's VR. And now maybe you want to test that inside the headset. This is the Oculus Rift. Oh, this and, is the Rift. And okay. GHTC Vive is also supported by Babylon GS. We are currently supporting any kind of devices. Okay. Wow. Ah, oh, so very nice. Holy cow, you can see the whole scene. Very nice. It's super smooth. It's very smooth because in VR, we were on ring faster than 60. Now, I see down here some controllers yes. sitting on the table. What would it take to add interaction? So by default, in Babylon, you have the controller being displayed, but we don't have a default behavior yet. OK, so you can see the controllers, but if you want to do something, you're you need to, some to write some yep. code. You can see that we are sending a ray. And this ray That's is... That's this Babylon ray helper you're sending on. Yes, this is a single line of code. And when you're moving the controller, you can see that it's moving uh, the ray. That's it's, super cool. You can select an object like that, like the cube, it's yep. showing the colors. And you can see it's currently uh, drawing something on the floor. The idea is when you put the headset, be able to, um, to, to, to select something and then to jump directly there. Ah, so we just did kind of a teleportation. Yeah. This is move, teleport. Yes. Selector two. Exactly. So if it's the ground, we jump to it. Otherwise, we can go select yes, objects. Then it gives you, you a need cool to way. Which object you want to interact with and which kind of behavior you like to code. And this is the role of the developer to do whatever you want. Cool. So I, the thing that's amazing about this is just how easy it is to put together very sophisticated kind of interactions and all open source. Yes, it's all open source, so if people want to contribute and say that our current VR implementation is maybe not good enough, we're really listening to the community to adapt the code itself, and people, most of the time, this is the beauty of open source, contribute to the code. Awesome. Thank you. Many of the problems that we're off tackling now are these very deep industrial kinds of problems where we're looking at a digital replica of things that are in the physical world. Our teams have been working together. Um, to solve these kinds of problems. Well, I, I got a couple experience. I was talking to our CTO and our development group, and they wanted to give a shout out to uh, the developer experience organization, especially around HoloLens. Uh, they've been working tirelessly, integrating, uh, having uh, phone conversations in the middle of the night, because we're in Cambridge in the UK, um, having hackathons, I guess is what, I don't know what that actually means, but we appreciate and thank you for all your support. But we got a lot of work to do still. Uh, two questions in one, which is the, you know, look forward a little bit. What do you see in the next, you know, year, two, three, as you're working on this? And then what are some of the challenges we collectively still have to overcome? Well, I think, I think it kind of going back to how we're really working together, uh, any kind of information that's coming out, anything that's coming out of uh, Microsoft that kind of helps us build for the, the next version, you know, of, of any kind of technology that you have is, is really important. We've been utilizing our relationship with Microsoft to really push the boundaries on GPU computing. We're in 85 or so of the top 100 hospitals, so our customers are generally large customers, and most of them are, of course, utilizing Microsoft products. Inside of our system, we had an ASIC-based board, a custom board that we built, and we just moved off of that board to do huge amounts of rendering. It was just simply never possible before... GPU-based computing came uh, not even of age, but really just recently was capable. And now Microsoft, they understand HIPAA security, and at the same time, they were a first mover into GPU computing. I think maybe a metaphor, when I was a, my, my kids use uh, Minecraft, right? And they're, they're building things uh, together as teams. Uh, so in, in the industrial world, uh, it's the same complexity. We have engineers that are spread out all over the world that are designing complex assets. We've kind of been able to solve that with sharing data, but we haven't been able to solve that in the Minecraft sense where we're looking at the same 3D object and working on it collaboratively together. So I think that's something that I'm looking that's forward very to powerful. for oh, yeah. you guys we, to we help are, us we, with. So we have that today. So it was one of the first things that we need because a surgeon, mm -hmm. he can't have an lens 
uh, alone. Yeah. So many surgeons have to have the same environments. Mm. So today we are building the same scene at the same time. And uh, the beauty of the uh, GPU Azure, it's you can bring all the files in uh, the VRAM and you can share all the view for everyone. Right. Sharing content, I agree, but now like multidiscipline teams like yeah. process mechanical, instrumentation, yeah. electrical, different engineering disciplines yeah. where they're on the same object yeah. but they're doing their own thing. Yeah, right. That's, that's, Rather than you, I don't have to. I just have to see what that other guy's doing, but I'm doing my own work. This is sort of a really phenomenal kind of conversation. If you think about what's going on in terms of you know CPU and GPU, just the compute power in the cloud, that next level of that AI capability, and then if we take Hololens, sort of on the front end, this mixed reality, that ability to bring it to life in 3D models, um, the ability to collaborate together, it's sort of things that people hadn't thought about. It's that next generation in, in many ways where, you know, we think about gaming and the fun aspect of this. The truth is these complex business processes and models and collaborating there could be the difference between life and death. Yeah. Could be sort of a, a change in the way um, energy is driven or, or created. I mean, there's just such possibilities. So we want to thank you for your time and for your partnership. And uh, we appreciate you making it today. Thank you very, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Wikipedia.org, Isaac Newton was an English mathematician, astronomer, and physicist who is widely recognized as one of the most influential scientists of all time and a key figure in the scientific revolution. When was he born? Isaac Newton was born on December 25, 1642. Wow! You look surprised. Did I get it right? Yes, you did, Zembo. Can you draw another picture? Yes, I'll draw another picture of Neil Armstrong. All right, well, we've been having a lot of great conversations today, and I'm pretty, I think John and I are both pretty excited about this one. This conversation is about bots, um, and this one's really fun because we have sort of the, uh, in many ways, the creator of our bot framework um, from Microsoft, as well as one of our top customers in terms of using it with Sage. And so I'd love for you to each introduce yourself and tell us a little bit uh, about what you've been working on. I'm Lily Chang, and I'm a distinguished engineer in Microsoft in the AI division. And I run the team that builds the bot framework, as well as the language understanding tools. We have about 130,000 developers building the bot framework, which is pretty cool. Just really psyched for this conversation, because for me, you know, where it all becomes magical is hearing what people are actually doing mm -hmm. with it. Awesome. Hi, I'm Kriti. I work for Sage. I am the VP of Bots and AI at Sage, which is a dedicated role we've created because we absolutely believe in the power of bots and AI. Um, just to give you a bit of background, Sage is a global enterprise company, accounting, payments, payroll, applications, and HR for um, users in 23 countries around the world. Our relationship with Microsoft has been absolutely awesome. We've been building bots on the bot framework for a very long time, almost a year. <laughs> Which is a long time, time in, bot, in bot space. So can you tell us a little bit about how you think about the pieces of the bot framework? So it's interesting, because we actually started by building our own bot a long time ago, and we thought, wow, we need a developer in our team for each channel that we want to have our bot well, surface a on. Channel? So a channel is really just an app where you can converse. So something like Skype or Slack or Facebook or Kick or just the web. We found that people want to be able to have a conversational interface wherever people converse. And so we just wanted to make it really easy to publish your service or your bot um, in lots of different canvases. So Kriti, you're, you're actually using both pieces, right? That's right. We love the multi-channel approach because uh, as I said earlier, we operate in 23 different countries and there are different channels that work in each one of those. Mm. And it might, Facebook Messenger might be a great platform for an entrepreneur running their business on their own, but there could be a larger enterprise who are using Skype or Slack. It's important to customize the experience for a channel-specific users. Mm -hmm. And also, if you look at the use cases of workflows, we are going after automating. We want people's work life, running their business, to be as easy as talking to a friend. You mentioned this notion of people think of the bot as their friend. As you were building the bot framework, 
were you thinking about these kind of commercial applications? You know, we started um, building social software a long time ago, and so we really know that no matter where you work, a lot of what you do is just conversation, right? And so how can you make these everyday tasks easier to use? I mean, it was really our hope that people would try to do more complex things. But I've always been really interested in the process of, you know, a company sees the data, and then they learn, oh, my customer has this question. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. you know, the data that you get back from the bot and how that knowledge kind of feeds back into the so, whole system? For us, uh, this was a new journey because it changed how we manage or create product roadmaps. So previously, well, and I say in the old times, I mean like a year ago. A year ago. ago. <laughs> <laughs> so a year ago, if you had to decide the next three features to build for any product, including a bot, you would do a user research session, right? You'll bring people in and you'll show them the product or you would do a survey afterwards. And now users just tell us what they want in a natural conversation, just like you're talking to a friend. Hey, you did this task for me, great. Can you also help me with something else? And that is product development for us. That's our roadmap sorted. Very and we can, we can quantify it and that's how we make decisions. We have become much more data driven. We've been talking a lot about the bot framework and channels and how all this fits together. We have a video of using the bot framework for a pretty novel application, which is connecting that same conversational interface to a robot. Should we take a look? Hey, Matt, welcome. Thank you. We've got this really cool robot that we've been working on with our partner, Asus. Yes. So built into the robot is this ability to listen, send that information up to the cloud and use the Microsoft Cognitive Services to recognize the speech. And what we're gonna go do is add some special new functionality using this cool thing called the bot framework yep. that Microsoft has been producing. So I've got Visual Studio Code open and we're gonna load in the bot builder and use the Restify library to create the listeners that are gonna be required to send messages back and forth. We go create the REST server, and then we're gonna pull out the information like the port and the app ID and password from a .env file, and it'll all be up and running. So let's get down to the meat of this thing, and it's really simple. One server.post, set it up to, to listen to post messages, set it up to that connector to listen, and here's our code for a bot. Yes. I mean, it, it's really pretty amazing that we can create a bully interactive bot with just this little bit of line of code. So we'll just echo back what we heard, and we'll send it back. All right, so you're just repeating back whatever we tell the robot. Yeah, now you can do some other really cool stuff with the robot. Yes, so because the robot has a face, right? So the robot can smile, can shake the head, and so on. We, we added a little bit more capabilities when we respond. So if I scroll down into this little piece of code, that's how I say, this is the facial expression I want you to show when I'm saying this thing. Got it. Right, so we're assembling this into a message and I have this method called build answer to do that. So what we can do here is coming back to what you just did, which is the response I've heard. And what we can do is build answer, builder, session, and response. So what are you doing now is taking your I've heard something and adding all these emotions, moving heads, and saying, go robot, do that. That's pretty cool. So we git deploy this. So git add, git commit, and test, and git push. All right, so now that's off. Because we've changed GitHub, the server is going to go auto update. Yeah. Should we see it in action? Yeah. Hey, Zambo, say something. You said, say something. Very cool. Yeah. Now, Matt, it would be fantastic if we could have the robot kind of understand what it was seeing and contextualize that as part of the response. So we have this new API called Custom Vision API. And what's interesting about it is that I can teach it to find out in images what I want it to find. Huh. So for example, we're interacting with Zambo and maybe I want Zambo to know if it's an empty room or if I'm in front of Zambo or if I'm showing something to Zambo, a picture or something. Then I basically just upload my images, right? Images of me holding pictures and say, these are pictures. And what I do is I just tag them. I say, this is a drawing, this is a person, okay. this is a room. And when the model is Finish training. What I get here is a URL I can call. It's basically so a REST API. Rest, yeah, okay. Right? And I ask, what are you saying now? And I get this response. So, what we are going to do with your code 
is add these into it. So Zambo uploads images to our blob storage. So next time when we're talking to Zambo and receive a message, we're going to check this blob storage and ask the Vision API, what is this? And so now and it'll give us back that tag. Right. So let's do that. So what we're going to do is I wrote this little REST call here. That's just a REST call. It's a request calling node. OK. And all I'm doing here is giving a URL, which is our custom vision URL. And I'm asking, what's this image? Call it, check the result, and respond with the JSON that I get back. Got it. OK. So what we do back in your code here is we call this method called analyze custom vision. And this is how Zimbal tells me this is what I'm seeing right now. When I receive a message, and the message contains text, it also contains other things. And in this case, Zimbal gives me this is the URL for the image I just saw when you're talking to me. Ah, very cool. Right? So what I do is add this image here. And of course, this is an asynchronous method. So what we do is we have a result. Lambda function here with the right. callback. Yep. Yeah. Move that code down inside. Right. And I see, right? Uh, and in this result, I have uh, predicted tags. Zambo may see many different things in the same image. Maybe I'm seeing you, but I'm also seeing a cat, and I'm seeing a door, right? So it's going to give me array of the things. Yep. OK. In this case, I'm just guessing all I care is about the first item, that array. I don't care it's about great. anything else. Great. And this is it. So now I'm saying I'm seeing a drawing, I'm seeing people or an empty room. So let's do the git thing again. Uh, git add git commit second test. You can pretty much say whatever you want. You got it. Okay. Yeah. So hey Zembo, what do you see? I see drawing. Awesome. That's pretty cool. It works. Yeah. Now you've got. AI being used to do the speech to text. Yes. You've got AI and that training that you did around the images. But all that stuff is packaged up into these super easy to use modules so that we can add intelligence to a robot. Or anything. Yeah. Well, really appreciate your showing us that. Thanks. Uh, have a good day. You too. And I think one of the things that's fun is this notion of a physical instantiation of both the cognitive services and the bot framework where you sort of get this manifestation of what it can be. And, and there's a ton of fun both to, to build that capability, working with ASUS, and then, of course, um, what it comes out with. We were sort of laughing when you said, you know, a long time ago, a year ago, people were, <laughs> for not very many people were looking at bots or even using the word AI. And now, speech and dialogue and, you know, these physical instantiations, I mean, that just seems like it's taken off in the last four months. Since we're working on faster time frames, what do you see in the next six months to a year that's of interest to you in this particular space? I think this next year, we're going to see people really start to understand what are the building blocks in bots and, and have more predictable ways that they can interact and just better examples. Because we know this ecosystem is early. And we really want to think of ways that we can help developers, help investors, you know, help all the channels build their business on these tools. I think consumers will become more aware of what a bot is and stop asking it out on date every time we talk to them. <laughs> Awesome. And that's progress. Yeah. <laughs> Look, we appreciate you guys making the time today. This Thank was a great you. conversation. And so, really, really, thanks for making the trip. Thank you for coming over, Lily. Sure. Thanks, thanks. a lot. Thanks, yep. guys. Good to see you, man. Yeah, Good to see you. Look at that. Hey, brother. Oh, Good to see you. Guys. Guys. Look at this. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Come on in, guys. Make yourselves at home. This is pretty cool. So uh, we've, been, we've been having conversations all day with you know, developers uh, really around different parts of the technology stack. And so we've been talking containers, mixed reality, bots, all types of things. But you know, one of the things is that everybody at this table um, has been with us for a while. We've had the opportunity to work with um, Gobbler and Music and Picket. Uh, and Sensoria, you know, going back to build three, four, or five years ago. And so I'd love to uh, hear a little bit about the technology journey for each one of you. Um, working with Microsoft has been eye-opening because what started out as one platform, one SDK, 
a simple kind of vision. And where we are now is we have an SDK that can grow with the customer, grow with the companies and partners we're partners with. And so now it can enhance all these different experiences that people want. For us, it was actually a blend of things because not only are we a cloud-based company, but we also have a desktop application. And our application is actually sort of an application of applications because we're actually using it to download and install other applications and authorize them. The transition from Amazon to Azure for us was actually so painless. It actually happened in a matter of about six minutes. We, I mean, we could never have done that on our own. You know, you're the biggest software company in the world and you have the resources to transform yourself quickly over time. And so what happens with us actually is we find that we're behind your changes. I'll read something and go, wait, what, when did they put that, when did that happen? Partnering with Microsoft, uh, that was so scary in the beginning. Of course, there are things that we are missing in the beginning when it comes to some of the APIs weren't ready for us, of course. But I mean, we had the opportunity to work together with the guys to say that, okay, we need this part of the API open, we need this open, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, was it painless to, to go from AWS to Azure? For us, I think it wasn't really that painless. It wasn't six minutes, actually. Uh, it wasn't super hard, but it's, it required some, some work from our side, of course, but also from the Microsoft side. We need a lot of good partners to partner with inside the Microsoft ecosystem as well. And the other great thing is having the, the ability to choose uh, almost a la carte components that are more or less powerful depending on what you need to do. Things like that really makes like where uh, to start. the work uh, <laughs> yeah. very easy for, for the team. So it'd be interesting to hear your perspectives on what kind of went well when we got our developers together and then what were some of the challenges and how we overcame them. From the very beginning, you started to listen to the ideas that we had. That is how a true partnership actually looks like that it's not just us screaming for more resources or more technology or better information or whatever it could be. We also have to give back. And I think that you have really had people encouraged to do this. And that is what I think is the most fantastic thing. For us, it just wasn't clear how to like unearth everything. And if we're gonna move to it, which at the time was a you know more modern platform in a lot of ways, there were things that didn't exist in Azure when we first got started. And so the devs started with, well, are there workarounds? And then it was, oh, actually, maybe this would be something that we should add in. And and that that's when everything clicked for me. It's rare when you actually get to work with supremely experienced devs. And I think that that actually really helped in our, at our company change a certain amount of our thought process. I don't think my team would have, like, moved as fast as they did because they didn't feel like this big company was overpowering them and telling them what they were doing wrong, but it was almost like guidance and a little like Yoda namaste that came in, you know, that they needed, you know, because they were just getting stuck in things that maybe a more experienced developer wouldn't get stuck in. I constantly tried to criticize myself and my team to try to, you know, in the hopes of trying to become better. I guess answering your first question, you know, what were some things that maybe didn't go well? Yes. You know, the bad is, I think transparency may be seeing a little further out in the future, because as we're, you know, allocating resources, time, budget, people, not knowing certain things exist until we're already kind of two feet into something, mm -hmm. it means that, that I get a little frustrated because I wish that I could either hurry up and finish this, or I could then get another team working on this other thing. So having transparency might allow us to make better informed decisions. Good, good, solid piece of feedback and a, totally fair. I mean, you know, your, your collective contribution to the code, you know, John and his team write a, uh, a summary up about once every four months of all the feedback we get, both from the startup community and other developers, and we bucket it out. So it could be Bluetooth issues in Windows, it could be something on Azure, it could be the APIs for O365, and these are all areas, you know, that we've worked on, Azure on the same thing, you know, and over time, your feedback has actually gone into the product groups. And one of the things we're able to do is aggregate that feedback up. Yeah, across know, all the with, different companies. So we can really see yep. some trends. With real examples, yeah. you know, with real code samples. So when you share your code and we work with you on that stuff, we can use that to go back to the product teams and say, hey, here's what needs to change and here's why and here's the scenario they're trying to enable. And changing topics a little bit, what advice would you give for startups that are paying attention here and watching? Can I start? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> For all of us, I, I think we're doing this based on passion, right? So it's super important that we actually keep uh, looking into ourselves and say, okay, why am I doing this? I mean, of course, you should listen to the input you get. Create this foundation of trust and passion. That is how you actually 
uh, create something that's really good, I think. I actually echo a lot of what you, what you were saying. If you're not committed to it, then no one else will be either. And I always tell my people, no one works for me, they work with me. And I think that when you have that mentality, I think that you can really get the most out of people. And if you get the most out of people, then you actually have an opportunity to change the world. But if you don't believe, if you won't do everything to do that, they don't expect that to be handed to you. Yeah. Chris? Um, I agree with all of that. I would also say people can totally sniff BS and really smart people can do it really well. And if you're, if you're in a high stakes game and you wanna have the best people involved in what you're doing, you've gotta come forth with who you are and what you believe in and do it in the truest way possible because at the end of the day, if you're gonna fight the fight and win the war, you've gotta do it with everyone fundamentally knowing who you are and what you stand for. And when you do that, you find loyalty, you find good partnerships, and you can find success. And I think on top of all of that, you have to be fearless. You have to be prepared to fail. You have to be prepared for your business to go out of business. You have to be prepared to make the hardest choices you've ever made in your life, even if, you know, it hurts. Every but, day. but, but, you know, it's go big or go home. I mean, that's how, I mean, this is the hardest fight you'll ever have. And to succeed in it, you know, you have to be prepared to go all out. And if you play it safe, then someone else is gonna be right behind you, you know, going for it and skipping right past you because um, playing it safe doesn't win the, at the end of the day. And uh, so if you're true to yourself and, and you take the risks that are necessary to push your company forward, you know, you'll have a better chance than most. Awesome. Yeah, so the path to success is really hard and nobody will care about the company like a founder would do. So you really have to be super passionate and uh, prepare to fight a very hard fight every day there are a lot of things that come your way that don't go as planned. Uh, you also have to have a plan B and a C, and, and you will use all, the, all of them. I think learning from your mistakes, too. You know, not being, you know, look, cut bait. If you, if you mess something up, I think just moving on and being okay with that, <clears throat> not worrying about ego, because I'll tell you what, you know, we mess things up a lot. But by messing up is how we figure out how to do something better. This was, I'm gonna, I want to end <clears throat> on that one, because I think that advice for startups, you know, we're looking at four passionate you know founders who have been they're not in that beginning phase you've been at it for a while we've had the opportunity to, to partner and learn from you guys all the way to the software code we built to how our culture changes etc so I would you know say to everybody watch you know keep an eye out for Pickett and Sensoria and, and Gobbler and music and you know watch these companies and learn from their example it's it's just as big an honor for John and I to to watch and learn from you guys as uh, as it is from anybody else so we appreciate it Thanks Thank for making you. the time. And, uh, Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right, let's close this thing down, Googs. Let's shut her down. All right, fellas.